Oh my God. You see what I'm saying? So, that was a liar. So, moving on. Wow. <laughs> wow. In the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, also called Niger, Lucius, and Manan, who had been brought up with Herod and Saul. Father, whatever you have tonight, Father, whatever flesh or the devil or the enemy is trying to keep us from receiving, we ask, Father, Holy Spirit, that you intervene, redeem this service, Lord God, impart your word. Father, I understand, Father, what's going on, Father, but I'm asking, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would bring uh, an incredible work of revelation, of impartation, wisdom, and grace to all of us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I am more convinced that uh, this isn't about um, how um, this isn't about how anointed I am or am not. But it's clearly a warfare against just the word of God, period. When you just simply take chapter and verse, you simply let it say what it says, you're not adding bias, you're not adding your own preferences to it, and you start touching on things that aren't popular in in quote unquote Christianity, you start touching on things that maybe challenge the normal Protestant view, that I'm pretty sure that the enemy's not going to be okay with that, especially when it deals with the Jews and Israel. Now, tonight, this is why I'm really interested in what, what just took place in the last 45 minutes. I've been here for three hours, and I don't know, I mean, I don't think I need to say this, but it's not like I just walk in here at, you know, 545 and just hope stuff is working. I'm always setting stuff up, making sure it works. So whatever just happened in the last 45 minutes, the devil's a full time liar. So, and, and like, right, like, it was like a button that has never been pushed before. There's no way you'd even know that that was pushed or turned on in 10 years, never seen anything like it. It's just ridiculous. So, thank you for letting me vent and get that out. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Anyway, we've been dealing with, uh, we hit Acts chapter 10, and we're talking about how uh, God is, uh, has allowed uh, the Gentiles to come in. To the fold, and how um, it's been—it uh, was kind of uh, controversial, and how it relates to specifically, I believe, what's just even right now, how there is a an interesting thing going on with uh, uh, race and ethnicity uh, in a way that I've just never seen it before, and it's just the parallel of what we're reading um, in Acts is very fascinating to me as I'm putting these sermons together. However. Regardless of whatever political spin that, and I'm not talking just a politician will put on. Apparently, that's the new thing uh, this week that the politicians and, or the, the pundits and the, and, the, and the talking heads and all the uh, the news commentators are now having battles about quoting scriptures back and forth. Apparently, that's the new thing this 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 week. However, regardless, none of that is as important as the eternal souls of men. So what God has established in Acts, ultimately, is for all men to be saved. The reason why I believe there's a supernatural template or a unique template that you're about to observe in this path, uh, specifically what we're going through tonight, and how it leads into next week, because it's this is, it's, I normally have an understanding of what I'm going to be speaking on, or okay, the Holy Spirit say, you know, do this series next, do this series next. However, it's very rare when I get the, the uh, template for the next sermon for the next week because it's so much to just put in one week. This is the first time we're, in a long time where God has connected this sermon this week and has already had to get started on the second, on the, on the sermon for next week because they are connected with two separate facets of the same priority for the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit that was moving at this time during the book of Acts, I still believe, wants to and is planning on moving here today in Kansas City on this side of eternity. When we read the book of Acts, we better not simply read it as, well, what they used to do back then and what God's will was back then. I believe it's the same will, the same purpose, because again, that is why they got the results that they got. So in this passage of the scripture, I notice it says that the church, prophets and teachers, prophets and teachers are still necessary in the body of the Messiah. And I, I also want to pay attention to this, and uh, I brought it with Herod and Saul. You're going to see why this matters uh, in a second. Uh, note 1A. While they were worshiping the Lord, 
or some translations say ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, while they were worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit, I'm just trying to get a word. I wish God would speak to me. Do you worship and fast? Why is it that God speaks to everyone else, but God doesn't really give me a word? Do you worship and fast? Here's a template right here. To get the Holy Spirit to move more in the body of the Messiah, worship and fast. Amen? Oh, that's that legalism, you know, fasting. No, that's the template. The Holy Spirit said, now, here's the other point. Who was calling the shots? The Holy Spirit was running things. The Holy Spirit was making declarations. The Holy Spirit said. They could have said because they just want to give Jesus all the glory. Well, Jesus said, the Lord said, but they wanted to be clear. The Holy Spirit is moving. The Holy Spirit is the commanding. The, he, we understand that he's connected to the Father. We understand he's connected to the Son. But they wanted to be clear that the role of the Holy Spirit is not something to be delegitimized or de-emphasized in this time. So, making fun of the Holy Spirit or making fun of spirit-filled churches or getting in these unnecessary debates, I just want the Holy Spirit to move and do whatever God wants Him to do in all of our lives on this side of eternity right now. Amen? The Holy Spirit says, separate uh, apart Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. He is the Lord, the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, in, in Corinthians it says, now the Lord is that Spirit. Where the Spirit. So we, have, we understand, Yahweh God is the Spirit who that worship Him in the Spirit of the truth. So you can talk to the Holy Spirit, you can commune with the Holy Spirit, you can fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and expect Him to give you orders, instructions, if you will. When they fast and don't want me and pray, they sit them on the way. Say, sit. Say, I'm ready to go, Jesus. When they worship, they fast, they pray, then God sent them. There's something about getting to the end of your fast. There's something about getting to the end of your worship. God has an assignment for every single person in the body of the Messiah. I call this fast confirmations. It's very interesting to me how many of God's people will make significant uh, 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 choices of, in their life, who to marry, where to work, where to go, whatever, and fasting won't need to be on the table. Praying won't be on the table. God's strategic permission, God's strategic permission for sanctifying decisions and callings is confirmed through prayer and fasting. The calling of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God was not disconnected from these two things. So you can get on online, you can get all these quote unquote counselors, all these life coaches. Amen. If they got wisdom, which they got from God anyway, praise God. But there's still something about the old fashioned way of praying and fasting and believing and expecting God to give you a word. Now, the other thing that I want to point out, because uh, the, the whole deconstruction of myths. Well, you know, he was Saul when he was that, you know, that persecuted Jew. But then when he got saved, then he became Paul. Right? Okay, we, got, we know we got saved in Acts chapter 9. Notice the specific notes in Acts 13.1. The Holy Spirit, the many who had been brought up with Herod and Saul, still call him Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fast, the Holy Spirit to separate Barnabas and Saul. Because he's not separated, he's still Paul, but he's not separating himself from his Hebraic identity. And it's more important to point out the Holy, neither did the Holy Spirit. Still calling him Saul. It's not one or the other, it's going to be both and. And when the churches of the world gets this necessity, it's not a suggestion about God's plan for Jew and Gentile to still work together to bring glory to the God of Israel. Paul, Saul. This is going to, it's going to have a lot more relevance um, Next week also with this this uh, this concept of both and the, the paradox, if you will. Sent by the Holy Spirit, verse 5, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. They proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. He says here in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You better not be ashamed to declare Jesus of Nazareth to your unsaved friends. Most of us are in a Gentile society, right? Most of us live in a place where, where uh, there's just a lot of stuff going on. 
However, the, it is the power of God unto salvation. Any secular doctor, if they came across a cure for cancer, would they be ashamed of it? Would they be embarrassed of it? Would they be like, well, listen, I don't want this to hurt your feelings. Doc, you better tell me what I need to know. But also, when it comes to the gospel, we're still embarrassed. We're still hesitant. But guess what? We also need to have the exact same boldness, not just when it comes to the Gentile, but also to the Jew. Yes. Amen. He says in Acts 3, I want to go back to Acts chapter 3, even though the template is still going to be in Acts chapter 13. But in Acts chapter 3, unto you first... God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turn every one of you from his iniquity. And the reason why these verses are important and in this specific uh, uh, section of 2C. Because even though we understand the gospel came to the Gentiles, but what's happened is people thought that, okay, so when Paul said the Jew first, because, you know, they're in Jerusalem, Pentecost, Shavuot, and then all of a sudden, then after that, it went to the Gentiles, and then that's where it stayed. But that's not the case, because we just read in Acts 13, after Acts 10, where did they go first? The Holy Spirit separated parts from the saw. Where did they go? To the Jewish synagogue. The Jewish apostles did not stop preaching the gospel to the Jews once they started preaching it to the Gentiles. And this is important chronologically because this is what has messed up a lot of theological understandings when it comes to uh, discipleship, when it comes to evangelism. If you read the text and don't understand what Romans 1.16 sets set as a template to the Jew first, that's still, that's not something well in Acts, it started in Jerusalem, and then it went to the other parts of the world, and it never went back to the Jews. No, they, every time they would go to a place, bam, first place was the synagogue. After Acts chapter 10 when the Gentiles came, or excuse me, when the gospel came to the Gentiles. More on that will be next week. Paul said the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers. Happy Father's Day. Our fathers. Um, verse 26, fellow children of Abraham and you God fearing Gentiles. It is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. Again, I'm overstating on purpose the chronology of right, what's going on. Acts 13. He's not saying, well, you know, at one time it was the, it was the Jews, then it goes to the Gentiles, and then that's just the rest of the, the gospel. He's still saying, it is to us this message of salvation has been sent. It is still necessary for the gospel to go to the Jews. Acts 3. Go back to Acts 3. It says, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant God made with our fathers. The covenant God made with our fathers. Is this about Jews? And I, and I have to repeat some of this because I don't know what, uh, uh, I, I don't know which sermon someone's going to listen to online and they may never hear this before. But, but this is not, oh, God loved the Jews more than the Gentiles. Or God loved the Gentiles more than the Jews, the other extreme. This is about covenant. God is a promise keeper. If God made covenant with, 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 with uh, 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 a bunch of uh, pygmies, or if God made covenant with, with a bunch of aborigines, whatever, then it would be that the gospel would come through the aborigines. And I'd be up here learning whatever aborigines speak. That doesn't, it's not about this ethnicity. It's not about, like I said, it's not about race, it's about faithism. God made a covenant with these specific people, and this is why the gospel has been confirmed through those people. The, but he says, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant God made with our fathers. Notice I'm going with somewhere. It's fathers. And when we think of the fathers, we think of the fathers of the faith. And nothing burns, boils my blood more when we talk about the fathers of the faith. And we talk about Calvin. And we talk about Luther. And we talk about all of these Gentile men who came through the Protestant Reformation like 1400 years ago. And we leave out Jacob and Isaac. We leave out Paul and Peter, the, the actual fathers of the faith. Romans 9, 4. When Paul's talking about Israelites, he says, to whom belong the adoptions as sons, the covenants, plural, the promises, and who are the fathers. Not used to be, 
Not one day will be in the eschatological, eschatological uh, manifestation of the, the kingdom of God and when the, the, the church is raptured out and then all of a sudden Israel will kind of come back on the stage. No, he's still saying that they're still the fathers. Jesus still upholds the covenant to Israel and to the sons and daughters of Abraham. Sons of the covenant. In our, what I call, uh, our, we have certain benevolence things, and then we have uh, certain uh, missionary things. Uh, our, you know, you, some of you helped with contributing to uh, the people in Haiti. Uh, we take that seriously. We want to affect people locally. We want to affect people uh, globally and internationally. But we also want to understand that there's another, I'm just being transparent with your money here, there's another budget that is designated in our quote-unquote missionary thing. It's called Sons of the Covenant. And those are for quote-unquote messianic ministries. Those are for people, uh, uh, whether specifically if they're non-believers that we can help. That is something that I've, I've been doing it for years, haven't necessarily told everybody. But I want you to understand Sons of the Covenant as it's in addition to why Romans 15, 1 Corinthians 16 talk about there was a collection of made up and uh, uh, taken up for who? The saints in Jerusalem. For a few Gentiles have been made partaker of the, 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 the spiritual things. You should also help the Jews in the carnal things, in the material things. Imagine if every church in America got that revelation. You don't think that would be an impact on the Jewish community? And all these goys, that's what we're called, goyings, Gentiles, are, are really taking their Bible literally. So I'm trying to not make this about how we can just be a better Christian. I'm trying to make this about how can we really be practical. Because a lot of people say, well, how can I bless Israel? How can I, how can I actually be more uh, an impact to the Jews? And I'm like, the, the template helps. These are the sons of the covenant. And... What better way of reminding them that than on Father's Day? Acts 3, note 4a. The God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has glorified his son, Jesus. But you denied the holy and just one and killed the prince of life. So we have to look at these passages because these are the passages that justify everything from the replacement theology. These are the passages that justify the anti-Semitism. Not just the Hitlers, but I'm talking about those within the church. And by the way, if you don't know, uh, another reason why non-believing Jews have a problem with still Christianity because a lot of non-believing Jews still think Hitler was a Christian. One, because Hitler said he was a Christian. Why do you think I'm always spouting off about, hey, uh, it's not about believing in Jesus. You better believe in Jesus believe. There is a difference. There is a distinction. You denied the holy and just one. Okay? Why? Here's an interesting passage. It's uh, same, same, uh, same verse, uh, or excuse me, verse 27. The people of Jerusalem and the rulers did not recognize Jesus, but in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Saturday. They did not recognize. Now, does that look like Acts chapter 13? Does that look like Acts chapter 2? Does that look like Acts chapter 1? Does that look like Mark, Matthew, Luke? But this is what the majority refers to as Christianity. You can't recognize the Messiah of Israel when you're praying to a dead woman. <clears throat> the name of tonight's sermon is You Better Recognize. When it comes to the marketing, the <laughs> when it comes to marketing the message, the branding matters. I will say it on the mic. I do not believe 
That every single person that chooses to, you know, uh, celebrate Easter in a specific way hates God and that they just don't want anything to do with that, that has, I do not, I'm not here to condemn their heart. I don't even believe, I believe that most of them don't even know what it is and just follow on. That's not what it is. So Jason, how come you don't do it? Because the marketing and the branding matters. That's not something that the God of Israel recognizes. I understand it doesn't matter to some people, but it does matter to people that care about non-believing souls that would use that as an excuse to say, well, that's got nothing to do with my God. You see, we talk about the martyrdom within Christianity, but we don't understand the martyrdom with the Jews. What they were doing when they were getting killed for their faith, because they're saying, Shema Israel, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Echad. I only believe in one God. I'm not going to accept any other God. Because it's kind of confusing when you're combining it with all this other stuff and then calling it Christianity and then saying, oh, it's the same God. No, that's, it's confusing. So we're just moving the stuff out of the way so that they clearly see that we are worshiping the God of the fathers. It says they found no reason for death, for death sentence, and they asked Pilate to have him executed. They found no reason for death. Now that's, that's, amen. Because if we understand why, because he was innocent and he was not a Torah breaker, he was a Torah observer. Now, that verse, by the way, keep, keep in mind, is important. When, when God allows this trial that goes on with Pilate, when God allows this trial, and, and when he's like, we can't find anything wrong because he did not break the laws of the Torah. So if you're being uh, uh, the historical Christian, and this is what I mean when I say the historical Christian, you, you, you have to understand it wasn't not long ago when a Christian would lead a Jewish person to Jesus. They would celebrate or they would make sure that he would actually leave in Jesus by bringing a ham sandwich to their house. No, this is true. And making sure that they really were a Christian. So that gives the impression that Jesus apparently was forcing people to eat ham. But they, the Bible says, no, Jesus wasn't doing that. Because they found no reason to actually crucify him. Because he still kept the Torah. When we talk about 1492, and that's great for the Americans to celebrate. That is when Columbus discovered America. But 1492 was a Spanish, also Spanish Inquisition. Where a whole bunch of Jews were kicked out of Spain. When you start studying the stuff with the Moranos. They were people that, they may or may not have had a faith in Jesus. But they were holding on to the things like Shabbat, like Sabbath. Like the dietary laws, and the church was kicking them out because of that because that was too Jewish. These are the things in the store and historical Christianity that a lot of people aren't aware of. But it keeps non-believing Jews from recognizing their own Messiah. However, the apostles go on to say, We tell you the good news. What God has promised our ancestors or our fathers, He has fulfilled for us. Their children by raising up Jesus. Note 5c, when they carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross, laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. This is the full story. This is the full entire story of the gospel. Here's what God did. Here's what, here's what uh, Pilate did. Here's what the Jews did. Here's what Jesus did. It's a full, concise uh, narrative about what actually happened and any person that decides to twist it or distort it for their own political reason is really being an affront to the gospel. He goes on. And remember, uh, we talked about uh, Acts chapter 2 and we talked about uh, the, the, one of the Bible studies I'd like to be at. And I was like, I'd like to be in that shovel Bible study where Peter is just breaking, he's preaching the gospel, and all he's doing is Torah, Psalms, Psalms, Torah. He's not quoting Matthew, because there is no Matthew. He's quoting Matthew. And he's leading thousands of people to the Lord by simply taking what was already written. I am, I'm, I'm 
encouraged and disturbed at the same time. I'm encouraged by people that really get it that there's a consistency between the old covenant and the new covenant of God just continuing his work of redemption. But I'm definitely discouraged by this, this still attitude that needs to be, um, that just needs to be uh, honestly confronted. I had a conversation with someone, I had another conversation again this week with someone, and they're, they're always asking about, well, how do we know that the Bible's a change, or how do we know that the Bible's right, how do we know that the Bible is, 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 mis, is maybe it's misleading, or there's all these discrepancies and changes. No first century believer that led a person to Jesus ever used a New Testament manuscript. Good enough for Paul. It's good enough for me. The New Covenant Scriptures, love them. They confirm what Moses and the prophets wrote. They tell you, they, they fill in the details. Praise God. But the point is, what God, when God says that his word doesn't change. When Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the, the, the law, I came to fulfill it. What was written, Jesus fulfilled. But what was written? was not the New Testament. He fulfilled what was written in the Old Testament, or Old Covenant, as I'm afraid. As is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your Holy One see decay. Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep, he was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Make sure in your witnessing God really wants you to be confident that you can trust his word. God wants you to be more confident that you can trust his word to lead other people to his son. Because it's one thing to be like, oh yeah, God said it, I believe it, amen. We can get our religious, uh, uh, you know, the, the religious quote that we can ask God said, I believe. But do you actually believe that God can use his word to actually impact someone else's life? That's where the challenge comes. Are you so distracted by their reaction? Because, it's, again, it's going to be something they haven't uh, uh, heard before. It's going to be something that, that it's maybe countercultural. But, the, the, but not being ashamed of the gospel is understanding whatever God said is worth repeating. Because they had every they had every reason to quote unquote reinvent or reinterpret or make up something. These are hundreds of what he's read the Psalms. This is hundreds of years ago, a thousand years ago. Every excuse that the world uses today, well, you know that outdated book and that was back then. What what outdated to them? It was just as fresh and even more fresh because of the revelation of Jesus than it was when David wrote it. The Psalms. When you stick to the script. Jurors, <laughs> when you stick to the script, jurors, even your enemies will not find a good excuse to condemn you. They might find an excuse, but they won't find a good one. They found no reason. They found no reason to actually crucify him. Why? Because he always stuck to the script. You want to listen? Go back to that time when you was trying to witness somebody, and then all of a sudden you try to get creative, and then you realize you were all off in the woods and the weeds, whatever. I get more confidence by just simply sticking to the script. Don't need to re, don't need to reinterpret nothing. Don't need to try to get creative. He says in Note 6a, I want you to know that through Jesus the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin that you are not able to obtain under the Torah of Moses. Remember, when you go through like Leviticus and stuff, it talks about um, a lot of the sins are the uh, mishkaga, uh, which meant uh, unintentional, so to speak. The unintentional sin. Now, the, the, when you get into the, the ma'alim, the potion, there's other words that refer to the intentional transgressions, so to speak. However, <laughs> let me just put it this way. Because the standard was so high when we owned the old covenant. See, we take our quote-unquote intentional sins for granted. 
Meaning, it's just like, well, you know, I know I'm going to go ahead and do this, but I'll just repent later and God will forgive me. That wasn't how it worked to me, no. That wasn't, that wasn't a uh, back in the day attitude. The focus was like, well, we know you don't plan on, you know. If you did something wrong, clearly it was unintentional. Clearly you didn't mean to do that. You see the standards way different than today. However, through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. Not set free to commit every sin. They're set free from that sin that you're not able to obtain under the Torah of the law of Moses. So he says, beware that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Relevant, 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 relevant. I said that four or five times because I usually don't use that word. You probably won't hear it because it's just. The things that the world is trying to call relevant, the things that the church is trying to call relevant, it's amazing how it just never seems to relate to the scriptures. Relevant has been the, the, the catchphrase to basically justify not using the scriptures. Relevant has been the term that you use when you say you don't want to see and sound so spiritual or you don't want to come off, you know, uh, pretentious or condescending. That's what relevant. But beware that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. That's pretty relevant. Just because they said it back then, the warning still exists for us today. But this part, verse 41, I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe even if someone told you. What if right now God was doing something right in your personal situation? Now, we understand this is a corporate situation. Uh, uh, Jesus is executed for the masses. The Holy Spirit flowing out. The gospel and preach, whatever. But there's also individual things that God wants to and possibly is already doing in your midst right now. Do you believe that he's actually doing it? And if God were to send a person to you and say, um, even if someone were to tell you, would you still believe that God is actually doing that? Hmm. I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone would tell you. The warning is a warning of unbelief. I am convinced that the enemy has stepped up his game when it comes to doubt and unbelief in the lives of the believer. I have not, I, I mean, in a season of, 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 of just, just hold on, I'm just holding on to Jesus. It's very clear to me that there is another level of doubt and unbelief that the enemy is trying to baptize the people of God with. Why? Because God has said that he's planning on doing something in your time. That you would believe it would be so incredible that you wouldn't believe even if someone were to tell you this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. But the warning is beware that what the prophet said doesn't happen to you. That you don't get distracted by the unbelief. Unnecessary current tragedies. Listen, there's a, there's a curse on this planet. Sometimes stuff just happens. That's why Revelation says, when it's, where I get happy, listen, I understand there'll be no more crying, no more tears, everybody's like, no sickness, no disease, whatever. But the root of that is the curse. So what I love about Revelation, one of my favorite verses, and it's talking about, you see the seeds, and then he says, oh, by the way, and there will be no more curse. So there are current tragedies that happen. But then, there are unnecessary tragedy. Things that should have been, could have been avoided. Unnecessary current tragedies occur when we ignore previous warnings. So in the midst of everything that I was uh, you know, studying, th that verse pricked me more than anything. Beware of us what happens to the, the prophet's forewarn doesn't happen to you. I'm like, well, what was it? What was it? Oh, God was actually doing something incredible.
incredible. God was actually doing something supernatural. God was doing something in the midst of all of the chaos, in the midst of all the confusion, in the midst of all the contradictions, in the midst of every single thing telling you that God was not doing it, but that didn't change the fact that he was still doing it. So it's hard to believe that in the midst of all of the ethnic tension, that God is still doing a thing of ethnic unity. Because you're not going to see it where, where he's in. Everybody's fighting everybody. It's hard to believe in the midst of all of the sickness and disease and all the things that, 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 that seem to be taking uh, just a funeral after funeral, that God is still bringing a word of healing. It's hard to believe that in the midst of divorce after divorce after divorce, that actually there are marriages that God is doing in the midst where there is still restoration. There are so many things that God still has for every single person on this side of eternity who still will believe that not only he's able to do it, but still believe that he actually is doing it. So I am rebuked or I am convicted because I have kind of let some quote unquote temper. I'm struggling with certain there's circumstances that are happening like, well, this, 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 what that still doesn't change the fact that God is still doing things in our midst. Amen? So as Paul and 